Today we celebrate the 11th Sunday after Pentecost and we hear in the Gospel today the cure of the deaf and dumb man and after being healed he spoke right. Now when we receive the sacrament of extreme unction the mouth is anointed with the holy oils as are all the other five senses. Overindulgence, overeating, but more especially the sins of the tongue by speech. As St John Chrysostom says, there is no member of the body by which the devil can deceive us so frequently and so easily as by an unbridled tongue and an unguarded mouth. As it says in Holy Scripture, many have fallen by the edge of the sword, but not so many have perished by their own tongue. Ecclesiasticus 28. Holy Mother the Church then, in choosing today's Gospel, is reminding us of the gift of the sense of the tongue and what it teaches us by its nature and its position. Now, we have only one tongue, as we know, yet two eyes, two ears, and two hands, and two feet. Why? Because God would teach us how sparingly we should use the tongue. We must speak no more than is necessary. For by seeing, hearing and touching, one cannot sin so easily as we can by speaking something scandalous or indecent, said St Basil. Now scripture says, The wicked man diggeth up evil, and his lips is a burning fire. A perverse man stirreth up quarrels, and one full of words separates princes. Proverbs uh, 16. Uh, St James says, the tongue indeed is also a little member and boasts of great things. Behold how small a fire, what great wood it kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue being placed among our members, which defile the whole body, being set on fire by hell. St James chapter 3. Now history teaches us that the devil misled Eve by one lie and hence mankind was thrown out of the Garden of Eden. The French Revolution and the uprising against the church and many other priests and religious that were murdered were due to lies against the church by Voltaire and many others. Experience teaches us the same. A single word can often cause bitter feelings, lawsuits, riots and so on. A singular scandalous conversation can cause one to lose faith and fear of God and lead to infidelity and vice. One can make restitution to stolen goods, but one cannot easily repair the damage done by slander or detraction. Now, the tongue has two principal veins. One goes to the head, the other to the heart. And what are we to learn from this? That the head is the seat of reason, or at least it ought to be. He is a clear thinker, he has a clear head, so we might say. Thus the vein to the head is an exhortation for us to speak rationally. However, there are many that speak without reason. When a drunkard speaks, he speaks irrationally and without sense and reason. And what many foolish things does the drunken man say? All irrational discourses are unworthy of a man, contrary to the will of God, and therefore sinful. We should sum them and anything that causes them. The vein to the heart teaches us that we should never say anything out what we do not mean in our heart. In our speech, therefore, we must detest nothing so much as falsehood, dissimulation and lies. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, Proverbs 12. The mouth that can be lieth killeth the soul, wisdom. And how much does God, who cannot deceive nor be deceived, hate falsehood and lies? For example, we read about Gazil in the fourth book of Kings, chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts, chapter 5, lying about a price of a piece of land sold to St Peter. And because of that lie, they both dropped dead. Now, as we know, the tongue is warm. We often put ice on the tongue to cool it down and like a cool drink. And what does a warm tongue teach us? That when we speak, it should be warm by love of God and our love of neighbour. By the love of God, 
All our actions should tend to the love of God. That is what we must be done because God wills it. In order to show him our reverence, love and gratitude, we must not pray out of habit or obedience to God's laws, but for the love of God. And when we give good lessons or correct our children or others, it is not from vanity or anger, but from the love of God. When we entertain ourselves in our discussions with others, it should not be for the sake of pleasure, but on account of God, for love of him. So he who speaks out of love for God gains a threefold advantage. He preserves his tongue from evil talk, lies, slander and detraction. His words are meritorious and deserving of a reward hereafter, as God will reward us even if we give a glass of water to a thirsty man. And of course it warms the hearts of others and enkindles in them the love of God. Thus the risen Saviour on his way to Emmaus inflamed the heart of the two disciples and his praise conversations. Was not our hearts burning with us when he spoke along the way and opened to us the Holy Scriptures? Said the disciples, Luke chapter 24. And the tongue is warm for the love of neighbour. This must manifest itself in our words and actions. If our words come from a heart inflamed with love of neighbour, then we shall not utter words that might grieve, offend or injure. Thus we should not revile or slander anyone, nor treat harshly but leniently. Genuinely love our neighbour to take care not to scandalise him, but edify him by capious conversation. And as we know, the tongue is soft and flexible. An exhortation to us that in all our conversations, we should observe meekness and a yielding temper. As Proverbs 15 says, a mild answer breaketh wrath, but a harsh word stirreth up fury. An unkind word may even make good people angry, but a kind word corrects and amends even the ill-disposed. Saint Saint Margaricus. Thus by meek conduct we win the hearts of men and lead them to the right path. Now we look at the position of our tongue, it's the upper part of the body. So it's an exhortation to us to speak more with God than with man, to speak more of heavenly things than of earthly things. And love above God above all things is the first and greatest commandment. We often journey a great distance merely to talk to friends for a few hours or a few days. Why should we not then like to speak to God whom we love? Prayer being nothing else than a conversation with God, it ought to be our favourite occupation. Pious people and those who love God are always fond of prayer, as we see in the lives of the saints. Saint Martin, Bishop of Tours, prayed until death took him and closed his lips. Those to whom prayer is a burden and who neglect family devotions, church, and ridicule those who pray, that one should not think themselves that such people love God. As scripture says to the Corinthians, if any man love not our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. And the position of the tongue on the upper part of the body reminds us that all our thoughts and desires should be directed to eternal things. As St Paul wrote to the Colossians chapter 3, Seek ye the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Mind the things that are above, not the things that are on the earth. And we all know people like to talk about those things and interest them. Hence worldly people will speak of money and property, enjoyments and pleasures. Holy people find pleasure in speaking of God and divine things. Saint Benedict and his sister Saint Scholastica visited each other once a year and discussed only heavenly things. On the last time, Saint Scholastica prayed for a storm, so they spent the night in sweet conversation about God and his holy service. We can ask a question, what do we like to talk about? Now the tongue being below the eyes is also a lesson to us not to speak about anything that we have not seen ourselves, or in other words, not to gossip. B. 
bear in mind two rules. Do not believe every rumour you hear, but suspend judgement until you have found the truth. And secondly, to speak the faults of others only when they are beyond doubt and they are known, and when you can prevent evil or some evil from happening or achieve some good. And we must be careful not to give scandal by our discourses. King Henry II of England said, Is there no one amongst these who eat bread with me who will deliver me from this troublesome priest? And this was about Sir Thomas a Becket, who was then martyred by four knights who heard the king and thought they would be doing a service to the king. So we should guard then against levity and imprudence in speaking. And we must also look first to our own faults and amend them before we censor others. As our Lord said in St Luke chapter 6, cast first the beam out of thine own eye and then thou shalt clearly to take the speck out of thy brother's eye. A certain abbot found out the friars were speaking ill of him. He returned with a sack of sand over his shoulder, small at the front, large at the back. And he said, the sand in the part of the sack hanging behind me represents my sins, which I carry on my back in order that I may not see him. The sand in front represents the faults of other people, which I always see and trumpet forth everywhere. But it should not be this way. I should turn the sack away, sack around, and have my sins always before my eyes and bewail them before God so that I may obtain pardon. The friars then took the hint from the holy friar, the holy abbot, and in future took care not to speak ill of others. We should always do the same. Now the tongue is also behind the lips and teeth as a reminder that we should carefully guard against it. Saint Basil said, God has given no cover to our ears, our eyes only light protection of the eyelids, but has surrounded the tongue by the double entrenchment of the lips and the teeth, that we may recognise our duty of carefully watching and guarding it. St James says, Every nature of beasts, of birds, of serpents and the rest is tamed, and has been tamed by the nature of man. But the tongue no man can tame, it is an unquiet evil, full of deadly poison, St James chapter 3. So the tongue is worse than the savage beast that can be tamed, but the tongue allures all men to sin. Now in order to guard against the sins of the tongue, it is necessary to love silence and avoid all unnecessary words. St Thomas Aquinas, as we know, was called the dumb ox, so called because he observed silence so strictly by his schoolmates. But his teacher said, this ox will yet fill the whole world with his bellowing. Saint Agatha kept a stone, Agatho kept a stone in his mouth for three years in order to exercise himself in silence. Saint Ephraim carefully avoided all useless and unnecessary words that on his deathbed could say, a foolish or bad word never crossed my lips. I have never spoken in all my life ill of anyone, and I have never quarrelled with man. So let us pay attention to these saints and imitate them. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, says St James. He who talks indiscriminately commits many faults, which will be a thorn on judgment day when our Lord asks for an account of every idle word. Much talking hinders progress in the way of virtue. Talkative people are not truly pious and will never be. Virtue and piety blossom only in silence and solitude. So if we get the chance for a retreat for six days or five days, it's a good opportunity to be silent and quiet. We read in the book of Proverbs, chapter 10, In the multitude of the words there will not be lacking in sin, but he that refrains his lips is most wise. Let us then be prudent and sparing in our words, think twice or more, and speak only once. And never forget the words of our Lord. But I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they will render account for it on the day of judgment. Amen. 
in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost.